بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم أرنا الحق حقا وارزقنا اتباعه وأرنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابه علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما أخرجنا من ظلمات الوهم وأكرمنا بنور الفهم وأنم علينا يا عظيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسل لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي أما بعد all praise due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and peace be upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I testify that there is no God except Allah and I testify that Muhammad is the Prophet and the Messenger of Allah. Brothers and sisters, I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for another great opportunity that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives every single one of us to be in such a gathering, a gathering of knowledge. As the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says in the hadith, إِذَا مَرَرْتُمْ بِرَوْضَةٍ مِنْ رِيَادِ الْجَنَّةِ فَرْتَعُوا If you ever go past a corner of the paradise, then rush into it. So they said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, and what's this corner of paradise? And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, the gathering of knowledge. So these gatherings are a corner of paradise. They are a corner of paradise that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us in this world, in which we sit down together for the sake of Allah azza wa jal, to learn more about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to understand our religion better. And there is nothing more important to us in our life than our religion. Our religion is our greatest asset. Our religion is our greatest asset that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us with. And uh, tonight, inshallah, we will continue with chapter 50 from the book that we've been uh, teaching out of, which is Riyadh al-Salihin, the corner of the righteous people. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from amongst them. And may Allah azza wa jal make this corner a corner of righteous people. Amin. And the, the title of tonight's topic is Babu al-Khawfi, the chapter of fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is a very important one. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands that we fear Him. And Allah azza wa jal has many rights upon us. And one of the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon us that we fear Him. And not only fear Him, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to fear Him the way He should be feared. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala He says, اتقوا الله حق تقاته في الله سبحانه وتعالى the way he should be feed. So not any fear, because a lot of people claim that they fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everyone could say, I fear Allah azza wa jal. But at the end of the day, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands that you fear him the way he should be feed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands that you fear him the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should be feed. Not the way that you think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should be feed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a special status of fear. That you must fear him, and your fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala must meet that status of Allah, must meet that status of fearing Allah azza wa jal. And uh, when you say that I fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and at the same time you disobey Allah, that's not meeting the status of fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's not fearing Allah azza wa jal the way he should be feared. But that's only a claim that you fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, وَلَا وَخَافُونِي as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says then fear them and fear none but me وَخَافُونِي and fear none but me so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands that we fear him and fear no one but him because the only one that's deserving of to be feared is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in many other verses Allah commands and demands that you fear him now the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not that you are petrified and you are shivering from the fear of Allah azza wa jal. The fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that compassionate fear that you fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with love. Like the fear that you've got towards your father, for example. You know that fear that you've got towards your father, when you fear your father, you've got that fear that it comes with it, accompanies that fear, that love towards the father. But then you've got another type of fear that you just run away from. Like for example, if you fear a lion, you run away from it. You fear something, you run away from it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is different. Allah azza wa jal, the more you fear him, the more you run to him. The more you fear Allah, is the more you are, you escape to him. And that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَخَافُونِ أَنْ فِي no one but me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, إِنَّ بَطْشَ رَبِّكَ لَشَدِيدٌ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's grip, and punishment is so severe. <laughs> and that's why, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's grip, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's punishment is so severe, you must fear Him. He created you, you must fear Him. He sustains you, you must fear Him. He controls you, you must fear Him. He will give you the jannah, you must fear Him. He will punish you in the hellfire, you also must fear Him. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says, وَيُحَذِّرُكُمُ اللَّهُ نَفْسَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns you of himself. Allah is warning you of himself. What's that warning? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying to you, fee him. Allah has that right upon you that you fee him. And Allah warns you that you must fee him. Just because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so compassionate, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so forgiving, and Allah azza wa is so merciful, doesn't mean you don't fee him. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so compassionate, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so merciful, and Allah azza wa is so forgiving, you need to increase from your feet to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not decrease from it. You need to get closer to Allah Azza wa Jal, not distant away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands that you fee him. Ittaqullah haqqa tuqatih. And these are very precise words. Fee Allah the way he should be feed. The way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is worthy of being feed. Not just a claimed fee. Because a lot of Muslims these days claim they fee Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But they do not show Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the fee that he is deserving of. They don't fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the way he should be feed. They say they fear Allah azza wa jalla, but they disobey him. That's not fearing Allah. They say they fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they don't even pray. That's not fearing Allah azza wa jalla. They say they fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but they still do haram. That's not fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah commands that you fear him. And not any type of fear. Fear Allah azza wa jalla the way he should be feed. Many other verses that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes mention in the Quran al-Kareem. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says, Ya ayyuha al-ladhina amanu, attaqu allaha, wal tanzur nafsum ma qaddamat li ghad, wa attaqu allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says, all those who believe, fee Allah. And then Allah azza wa jalla says, wal tanzur nafsum ma qaddamat li ghad. And let every soul and every person see what they're going to offer tomorrow. Because tomorrow you're going to stand before Allah azza wa jalla in the day of judgment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to expose every single thing that you've done. Little or big, minor or major, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to expose all that. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying to you, before He exposes you, watch what you do. Be observant of what you do. Watch and monitor every action that you do. Then Allah reminds you again in the same verse, وَاتَّقُوا so, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا اتَّقُوا اللَّهِ وَالْتَنْظُرْ نَفْسٌ مَا قَدَّمَتْ لِغَدٍ وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهِ خَبِيرٌ بِمَا تَعْمَنُوا And fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again. There's nothing, or there's nothing more that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had commanded in the Qur'an al-Kareem as much as He did command in the Qur'an al-Kareem for you to fear Him. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues to repeat and repeat and repeat and repeat in the Qur'an al-Kareem اتَّقِ اللَّهِ اتَّقُوا اللَّهِ اتَّقُوا اللَّهِ اتَّقُوا اللَّهِ في الله and then Allah Azza wa tells you to fee him the way he wants you to fee him, not the way you want to fee him. In this first hadith, as the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says in this hadith, إِنَّ أَحَدَكُمْ يُجْمَعُ خَلْقُهُ فِي بَطْنِ أُمِّهِ أَرْبِعِينِ I want to get to the end of the hadith here. فَوَالَّذِي لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا غَيْرُهُ إن أحدكم لا يعمل عمل أهل الجنة حتى ما يكون بينه وبينها إلا ذراع فيسبق عليه الكتاب فيعمل بعمل أهل النار فيدخلها وإن أحدكم لا يعمل بعمل أهل النار حتى ما يكون بينه وبينها إلا ذراع فيسبق عليه الكتاب فيعمل بعمل أهل الجنة فيدخلها هي النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم first speaks about the different phases and stages that mankind is created in the womb of their mother and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says the first 40 days and the second 40 days and then the third 40 days. And then the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, after the development of this fetus in the womb of the mother, so there's a first phase and stage of 40 days, then the second stage of 40 days, then there's a third stage of 40 days. In Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, after that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send an angel and this angel will be commanded to write four things upon this person. He will be commanded to write his sustenance, his uh, age, how long he's going to live for, his timeline, his deeds, whether he's going to do good or bad, and whether he's going to live happy or sad. Whether he's going to live happy or sad. Now obviously someone might say, you know what, that doesn't make sense. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala really decreed upon me what I'm going to do before I do it. But then at the same time, Allah is going to punish me for the things I do. Yes. Allah did decree upon you what you're going to do before you're going to do it. So this is a very clear and bottom line of it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had already written upon you what you're going to do. If you move this, this movement right now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had written upon me, I'm going to do it right now. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had written upon me, I'm going to be talking to you now. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had written upon you that you are blinking your eyes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has written upon you that your heart is beating. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had written upon you everything. 
<laughs> and when you pray, Allah had written upon you, they're going to pray. And when you don't pray, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had written upon you, you don't pray. When you do haram, Allah had written upon you, they're going to do haram. And when you do good, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had written upon you, they're going to do good. So someone might say, okay, so that means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had, read, had already written upon me what I'm going to do. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had already decided upon me what I'm going to do. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had already decreed upon me what I'm going to do. That means whatever I do, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to punish me if he had written upon me that I'm going to be from the people of the hellfire. Or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to give me the paradise if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had written upon me to be from the people of the paradise. Well, that question... This question was posed to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam was asked this question, and he was asked, "Alayhi salatu wasallam, O Messenger of Allah, since Allah subhanahu wa taala had already written upon us, if we are going to be from the people of the paradise, or we're going to be from the people of the hellfire, then what's the point of us striving so hard to do good if we're going to end up in the hellfire, or not striving so hard if we're going to end up in the paradise? Allah subhanahu wa taala had already decreed upon us." So Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam answered it in a very, very nice way. What did he say? In Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, after he replied to this companion, and this is a reply to every single one of us, he says, alayhi salatu wa sallam, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decrees upon someone to be from the people of the paradise, Allah will use him to do the deeds and the actions of the people of the paradise until this person enters the paradise with the people of the paradise. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decrees upon someone to be from the people of the hellfire, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will use him to do the deeds of the people of the hellfire until this person ends up in the hellfire with the people of the hellfire. Now my brother and my sister, you need to see yourself. What did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala choose you for? Well, let me say something to you. You've been part of this gathering. 100% Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had paved the way for you to enter the paradise. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will only invite those that he loves to something that he loves. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves these gatherings. So if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had put you in a position in which Allah azza wa jalla wants you to enter the paradise, what are you complaining for? You should be concerned when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts you in a position that you are leading to the hellfire. But when Allah puts you in a position that you are leading to the paradise, that's not something for you to complain about. That's something for you to be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because a lot of people become very concerned about other people. Be concerned over yourself. وَلَا تَزِرُ وَازِرَةٌ وَزِرَ أُخْرَى Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, every person will be responsible for himself. Everyone is reliable. Everyone is liable for themselves. You are liable for yourself, I'm liable for myself. I'm not liable for you, you're not liable for me. So everyone is responsible for themselves. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had put you in a position in which Allah azza wa wants the paradise for you, why are you complaining for? You should be striving towards that. You should be working so hard. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had written upon you when you were only four months old in your mother's womb, they're going to be from the people of the paradise. You should be very grateful to Allah. And what you should be focusing on and stressing over is that you want to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that had chosen you for this path. That's your stress. Not the stress, why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put people in the paradise and other people in the hellfire? That's unjust. That's unfair. Your stress should be, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had put you in a position that you are worshipping Him, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had opened that gate for you, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had paved the way for you to be from the people of the paradise, then you should be concerned over your gratefulness and thankfulness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for choosing you for this path. That's one. The other one is, a lot of people, not a lot of everyone, I'm not going to tell every single person, including the prophets and messengers, it becomes even hard for them to comprehend 100%. How does it work that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had written upon me that I'm going to commit haram, but he's going to judge me over the haram that I commit? It's not easy to comprehend that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had written upon me what I'm going to do, but at the same time, Allah's going to judge me over what I do. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, إِنَّ هَدَيْنَاهُ السَّبِيلَ إِمَّا شَاكِرًا وَإِمَّا كَفُورًا we had guarded him to either of the two paths. He could be either a thankful servant to us or someone who is non-thankful servant to us. Someone who's a believer or disbeliever. Now what we need to know, yes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had written upon us everything that we're going to do. The first creation that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had created was the pen. That's the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says the first creation Allah had created was the pen before all of us. Even some of the scholars say before the angels. The first creation of Allah was the pen. The second creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was a tablet. That's known as the preserved tablet, Allah al-Mahfud. 
When Allah created the pen, and how does that pen look like? Is it a Parker pen? A pen? Is it uh, a blue pen? Black pen? You know, people ask those questions. Subhanallah, people drift away from the core issue and start asking over irrelevant issues. Oh, was it black pen? Was it red pen? Was it purple pen? Inshallah, it was a pink pen. That's not your concern. Your concern is what the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says. He says the first creation of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala was the pen. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the tablet. And then Allah commanded the pen to write over or on the tablet. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded the pen to write on the tablet. What did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala command the qalam, the pen to write? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded the pen to write everything that will take place to the never ending time. Everything that's happening now, everything that's happened in the past, everything that will happen in the future that's all been written by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by the pen on that tablet. Includes today and yesterday and tomorrow and after tomorrow and a thousand years ago and ten thousand years ago and ten thousand years from now. That's all been written and decreed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before you and I were created. Before the angels were created according to some of the scholars. Before the prophets and messengers, before any mankind was created. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had already decreed what's going to happen to the day of judgment. See that leaf that just fell? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had written that on that preserved tablet. See when you blink the eye, Allah had written that on a preserved tablet. See that wind that just went past, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had written that in a preserved tablet. Everything's been decreed and written in a preserved tablet. So every move that you make, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had already decreed that and written that on a preserved tablet. Whether good or bad. So everything's been decreed. Everything that you're going to do. Before you did, it's already been decreed. However, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given you a choice for you to make. Allah had given you a choice for you to make. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will judge you over the choices that you make. Allah will judge you over the choices that you make. That's why some of the scholars say, Allah judges you over the choices that you make before He judges you over the actions that you do. Because sometimes you might be doing an action out of no choice. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to judge you over the action. So, for example, I asked for a cup of water and someone came and put half alcohol in it. I was in a restaurant. I'm not, like I'm saying hypothetically, I'm a, I'm a re- restaurant, and I asked for a cup of water. And then they looked at this guy, he's a sheikh, that you know what, we want to hit back at him, we're going to put half of his cup, alcohol. So they put alcohol in water, and I drank it. Drinking alcohol, haram or not? It's haram, isn't it? Okay. I drank alcohol, didn't I? Is Allah going to judge me over this? I just committed an action. I just committed a haram action. A haram action, I drank alcohol. Drinking alcohol in Islam is a sin, it is a haram. And I just drank alcohol. Is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala going to judge me over this? No. Why? Because I didn't make a choice. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala judges you over the choices that you make before the actions. So if you do something out of a choice, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to judge you. If you do something out of no choice, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to judge you. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had written upon us what we're going to do before we're going to do them. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had decreed upon us what we're going to do before we're going to do them, whether they're a good deed or bad deed. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the same time had given us a choice for us to make. Based on those choices, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to judge us. You chose to do this, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will judge you over that choice. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had already given you the capability of you making that choice. How do we make choices? What's that tool and instrument that we use in our body for us to make choices? It is the intellect, the mind that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed us with. The very first moment Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes the intellect away from you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't judge you anymore. That's known in Islam. As the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Allah doesn't judge any insane person. Why? Because he doesn't have the instrument for them to use to make that choice. The moment that choice is taken away from you, Allah is not going to judge you. As long as you have the capability and the ability for you to make a choice, Allah is going to judge you over that. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will hold you accountable. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had written upon you what you're going to do, but Allah had given you at the same time the choice for you to make. When you make that choice, Allah is going to judge you. How do they correspond? How do they meet? That's where you need to stop. Here you need to stop. Why? Because al-qada wal-qadar, the divine decree, it is from the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the attributes of Allah azza wa jal are beyond our imagination. It's not something that we can comprehend. You will never ever understand it. You will never ever comprehend it. And you will never ever have a good understanding of it. Why? Because it's an attribute of Allah azza wa jal. It's like when I tell you Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is strong. Okay, I'm strong. 
I could carry 100 kilograms. You know what? I'm the strongest man on the face of this earth. I could ca- carry a ton. But there's a limit at the end of the day, yes? I could be the strongest man can't ever exist on the face of this earth. I could carry two tons. But there's a limit at the end of the day. So you could measure my strength with how much I could carry, what I could do, and so on. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is strong. Can you measure it? Can you measure Allah's strength? How strong is Allah? You know, you've got atheists. You've got atheists. So th- that's the first question they pose to you. They say to you, if God is strong and he could do everything, can he create a big rock that he can carry? Can he create a big rock that he can carry? Well, that's a wrong question. You can't ask a question like that. There are questions that you could ask, and there are questions you can't ask. It's like, you know, you've got 10 people are racing, and then you've got the top three who won the race. So the one that came before the third was the second. And the one that came before the second was first. And the one that came before the first was... What what kind of a question is that? It doesn't exist. That question doesn't exist. So when you come and say, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, can he carry a big rock that he can't carry? That does not exist. Because it doesn't make, it doesn't correspond. They, they, it's a wrong question. Can you, can your son have you before you? It doesn't make sense. It just doesn't fit in. That's, that's a wrong question. It's a wrong question in its place. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he knows what you're gonna do. He had also decreed upon him what you're gonna do. But he had given you the choice for you to make. Based on the choice that you make, Allah is going to judge you. How does it work? That's something that you never grasp. Just keep out of it. And that's the warning of the Prophet Muhammad wasallam. He said, alayhi salatu wasalam, avoid talking about the qadr of Allah Azza wa Jal. Because there is an attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that's beyond the imagination. It's beyond the imagination. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is big. Can you imagine Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's size? You can't. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is beyond the concept of size. So when it comes to qada wa qadar, it is forbidden upon us to discuss that topic. There are limits, there's red lines, we're not allowed to cross them. We stop here. What we know is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decreed upon me what I'm going to do, and Allah had given you the choice. Based on the choice that you make, Allah is going to judge you. Because of this topic, we had a lot of groups in Islam they stemmed from Islam, or they were an offshoot of Islam. They went so deep into the topic of Qadr that some of them said they cry everything, and other ones said that Allah leaves in the air. They can't. They have no control over anything. If they commit adultery, that's from Allah. If they drink, that's from Allah. If they this from Allah, and that's why Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he warned us from going or indulging in the topic of Qadr. And during the time of Umar Khattab, if he, if he had ever heard anyone talking about the Qadr, he used to bring him and he used to strike him. He used to beat him up. Don't talk about the Qadr. The, the Qadr, the topic of Qadr is beyond your capability. Why? Because you are discussing an attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that's beyond your imagination. It's beyond you. So what we need to know is number one, Allah had decreed upon me what I'm going to do. And Allah knows what I'm going to do. And Allah is the one who had written on me that I'm going to do good or bad. At the same time, Allah has given me the choice. It is also a close analogy or example for example, as a teacher, if I've got 20 students in my class, I know the capability of my students. I don't know which one is going to pass and which one is going to fail. And I've given them all the exams. And there's 10 questions. And I've got each, I've got each student answering the question. In front of me, I could see some of those students are answering those questions wrong. But I know they've failed the question, yeah? I know they've failed the exam. At the same time, they're in the class with my unwillingness. I'm there. And I've given them the choice for them to also answer those wrong questions. At the end of the day, I know their capability, I know what they're going to do, but I've given them the choice for them to answer their own questions. Very close example, but not that close. At the end of the day, we're talking about an attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Which brings us to the main point, I know I drifted a bit, but <coughs> sometimes it's very important to talk about this topic. Then the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa says, But Allah in which there is no Lord except Him, one of you will continue to do the deeds of the people of the paradise. And listen to this, especially, subhanAllah, we had a gathering before this with the brothers that just went to Hajj. And it's very important to listen to this hadith because 
It's in line with the topic that we had spoken about before this gathering and about steadfastness. What does the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi say in this hadith? And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says that one of you will continue to do the deeds and the actions of the people of the paradise until his only one hand span before he enters the paradise. Imagine someone that's been working so hard for all his life to reach to the paradise, working for the paradise, and he's about to enter the paradise, he's only one step away from the paradise. Then, as the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, فَيَسْبِقُ عَلَيْهِ الْكِتَابِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's decree will change. And then this person will start doing the actions of the people of the hellfire. He will start doing the actions of the people of the hellfire. So unfortunately, after he was only one step away from the paradise, he started to do the deeds of the people of the hellfire, and he dies on that. Where does he end up in? وَالْعِيَاذُ بِاللَّهِ in the hellfire. And then the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu gives the opposite example. He says that one of you will continue to do the deeds of the people of the hellfire until they are only one step away from the hellfire. Then Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala will decree upon him to do the deeds of the people of the paradise. So he'll do the deeds of the people of the paradise, and he'll end up in the paradise with the people of the paradise. So imagine someone all his life he's been doing good until that last moment before his death, he ends up doing something haram. How many people do that? A lot. Believe me, a lot. Recently, I know someone, praise, praise, mashallah, old man, does so many good deeds. Before his death, he brought his children, he deprived the girls from his inheritance, and he said, only the boys. That's how I grew up in the farm. Subhanallah. What did you do before your death? You just disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and deprived your daughters from inheritance that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decreed upon them. And subhanAllah, he dies on that. I'm not saying that this person is going to the hellfire forever, but that's a punishment for it, unless Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives. Just someone's before their death, someone that has been working so hard for the paradise, and just before they die, they end up doing something haram. Someone who's been praying and fasting and doing so many good deeds, then he says, you know what, I'm just going to do this haram, well, Allah will forgive. So he ends up doing the haram, while he's doing the haram, Allah takes his soul. It happens. It happens. How many people, they pray and they do so many good things. Then the shaitan starts to whisper in their ear, in their mind. And they just want haram, just do one haram. Just want the haram, you know, do the haram. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take their soul while they are committing haram. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will cast them in the hellfire. And one of you will do the deeds of the people of the hellfire until there's only one hand span between them and the hellfire. And then Allah will change their life and enter the paradise. It reminds me of the story of Barsisa. Who is Barsisa? Barsisa was a very righteous man. And that's a hadith of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Barsisa was a very righteous man that people used to give an example of Barsisa of righteousness. So when they used to talk about righteousness, they used to talk about Barsisa. He used to be an example of righteousness and good character. And then one day, there were three men, they used to look up to Barsisa, and they used to respect Barsisa, and they used to learn from Barsisa, and they used to take him as a mentor, and they used to take him as a leader. And as a guide, and they used to get a lot of guidance from him. Those three wanted to go out in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They wanted to go out and fight for the sake of Allah azza wa jalla. But they had a sister, and there was no one to take care of that sister. So they went to Barsisa and they said, okay, there's no one better than Barsisa for him to look after his sister. Let Barsisa look after his sister. So Barsisa said, no, at the beginning, then they put pressure on him, so he accepted.